Today, I'm excited to unveil to you my ultimate theory, one untouched by studio interference, one unburdened by the needs of an algorithm. In this one video, I am freed from the shackles of convention and can present to you my true artistic vision. And now, for your viewing pleasure, my Snyder Cut Theory in 360p resolution just as it was always meant to be watched. This sucks. Hello Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, where the four-hour version of this episode is currently locked in a vault waiting for Warner Brothers to call and offer us 30 million dollars for reshoots. Well, while we wait for that call, I wanted to talk about the newly released Snyder Cut version of the 2017 movie Justice League, which I will be the first to admit was way better than I ever expected. I mean, take that with a hefty grain of salt, considering it's like one of the only movies I've seen in months and the original was real bad, but hey, set the bar low enough and you have nowhere to go but up. That was my motto in high school. Seriously though, my bro Zach actually pulled it off and transformed a garbage fire of a movie, both in terms of plot and coloring, into a a real movie with real characters and real stakes. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, here's the 30 second catch up. Back in 2016, WB and DC were in a rush to catch up with the massive success Marvel was having with big superhero team up movies, which, you know, it's gonna be hard for them when they had no team. At that point in time, they'd only had one movie, Man of Steel, and it wasn't all that well received. So instead of doing solo projects to introduce the characters one at a time, they instead tried to do everything all at once, jumping from here's Superman to now that you know Superman, here's this guy who dresses as a bat and wants to punch him, also Wonder Woman is here for reasons, and wanna see some YouTube clips of these other guys that may become important at some point? Also hallucinations! As you might imagine, that movie, Batman v Superman, came out to reviews that weren't so great. But Justice League, the immediate sequel, a film that's important to remember, was planned to be a trilogy of movies, was already well into production and set for release the next year at that point, so a bit late to make any changes there. Early test screenings for the first Justice League weren't great, and the studio was already eyeing major reshoots, so things weren't peachy, but they went from bad to worse when a family tragedy struck Zack Snyder and he had to step down as director, getting replaced with Avengers director Joss Whedon, who, at the studio's request, tried to change the tone of the movie to more closely match DC's more successful rivals. Unfortunately, the clashing visions of the two directors made Justice League Get it? Joss Whedon's Justice League. An awkward final product, prompting a huge fan movement for Zack Snyder to have the chance to finish the movie he started. HBO Max decided to grant everyone's wish, giving Zack and the team an enormous $30 million budget for reshoots, and yeah, the movie is out now, and objectively, it was a success. The Rotten Tomatoes scores for the Snyder Cut are 73% from critics and 95% from fans. 95%! They jumped right past Marvel numbers and went straight to Pixar numbers. And I gotta say, regardless of how you feel about the movie or DC or all of this drama, congratulations to Zack Snyder. I'm sure it is supremely satisfying to make the movie he wanted to make, to see it get such a positive reception, but most importantly of all, finally have this chapter come to a close. A movie that, I would guess, reminds him of what was undoubtedly one of the hardest moments in his life. So are the legions of fans who are campaigning for this finally satisfied? <laughs> who are you kidding? Of course not. If you give a mouse a cookie, he'll ask you for a glass of milk. You give him the milk, suddenly he's gonna demand a billion dollar film franchise. The story is no longer about hashtag release the Snyder Cut, the hashtag is now restore the Snyderverse, which, in case you're not familiar, means continuing the darker established storyline that Snyder had in mind for these films, as opposed to, you know, scrapping it all as recent news has suggested that the studio plans to do. And look, I know that other online commentators out there are annoyed by even more Snyder fan outcry, but personally, I think it's totally fine. I definitely don't like the fact that they review bomb other movies to get their message out there, or or how aggressive some of their tactics are, but those are just a few bad eggs in this group. Overall, I can't fault people for liking a series of movies, and then dedicating years of their lives to being fans of those movies, and then being disappointed when the movies don't reach their proper conclusion. No one likes an unresolved cliffhanger. That said, I'm also here today to tell those people to save their breath. In fact, I'm here to tell them to rejoice. Friends, spare your tweets. The Snyderverse is already restored. In fact, it never left. No matter what they say publicly about having no plans to move forward, that's exactly what they're doing. They planned for this to happen. And I'm 
not talking about this just from a sneaky business perspective. The proof is actually in the new Snyder Cut of Justice League. You heard me right. The Snyder Cut version of Justice League is actually canon to the established DCEU. In fact, not only is it canonical, it serves as the good ending to the complete Snyderverse story. So today, I want to put the issue to rest because in my mind, both the theatrical cut and the Snyder Cut can fit into the larger DCEU. If and only if WB and DC have the cojones to do it. So first things first, it's important to understand that coming up on DC's future release schedule is a Flash solo movie. See, it's been established for a while now that this movie will be inspired by the Flashpoint storyline in the comics, in which Barry Allen, the Flash, goes back in time to save his mother from being murdered by his arch nemesis, the Reverse Flash. Now, not to go on too much of a tangent here, but John Broom, the DC writer who created the Reverse Flash, he must have just phoned this one in hard. Just imagine his manager bursting into his office one day like, we need a bad guy for the Flash, and John was like, uh, Reverse Flash, he's just like the Flash, but a yellow where red should be and red where yellow should be. Anyway, by saving his mother, Barry accidentally alters reality in some major ways, but only he can notice. For everyone else, things have just always been this different way. DC also took the opportunity to use the Flashpoint event in the comics to make some major changes and fix their continuity, clearing away the unpopular characters and storylines to make room for the things that audiences liked. Hmm. Now, why does this all sound like the perfect thing for DC to do at this point in time with their movies? Could it have anything to do with the fact that as of right now, they have four completely disconnected projects all featuring Batman, Joker, Snyder's Justice League, Justice League, and Robert Pattinson's Batman. That's not confusing and bloated at all. Or maybe it's the fact that according to Wonder Woman director Patty Jenkins, even the movie directors at this point are ignoring the Whedon era version of Justice League, despite WB still holding firm that that is the canonical timeline. I mean, I could go on with more reasons why this franchise might need a universal reset at this point, but I think you get it. And while I say it's a solo movie, it's really shaping up to be a multiverse movie akin to Into the Spider-Verse. During last year's DC FanDome event, which it's worth noting had a hundred hours of streaming content about their upcoming projects available for, get this, one day, 24 hours. So I hope you're watching everything at three times speed. Not a great plan. The team working on the new Flash movie revealed the fact that not just one, but two Batman would be appearing in it. Both Ben Affleck's Batman from the current gen of movies, as well as Michael Keaton who played Batman in Tim Burton's original 1989 blockbuster. This strongly indicates that Flashpoint will be dealing not just with time travel, but with DC's multiverse. It's the exact thing that Snyder's new movie already is heavily alluding to. The anti-life equation, the key to controlling all life and all will throughout the multiverse. And I think you can start to see where I'm going with this. Of course, the Snyderverse is canon, whether explicitly or not, when practically everything is going to be validated in this upcoming multiverse movie. That's how you have two different Justice Leagues, both canon at the same time. But, you know, multiverses are the easy way out. I actually want to take it one step further. I want to show you that Snyder's new timeline is actually one and the same with the original and established DC continuity. It is canonical with the Justice League movie. They're all a continuation of the exact same story. The Snyder Cut is the good ending to our adventure. Let me explain. You see, when you have nearly twice as much movie to fill, you can do things like fill it with Icelandic song breaks and an egregious amount of moody staring. But in that extra amount of time, you can also make some pretty radical alterations to a movie's original story, including prophecies and extended epilogues set in the ruined wastelands of Earth devastated by the attacks of Darkseid and evil Superman. This is the nightmare future. That's a knight with a K. Get it? As in the dark knight. Anyway, in this thing, we see Wonder Woman dead, Aquaman dead, Flash as a hardened warrior, and Batman teaming up with the Joker. So... what? Where's all this coming from? Well, this was always meant to be a core element in Zack Snyder's Justice League trilogy back when it was supposed to be a three-movie series. In Snyder's original vision for Justice League 2, which he's been very public about, Superman would give Bruce Wayne the job of protecting Lois. Lois and Bruce would begin to have a love affair, which is a choice, certainly, and one that apparently was rejected by the studio, so at least they showed some good judgment there. Anyway, during a crucial moment, Bruce would hesitate, resulting in Lois's death, and Superman turning to the dark side brought on by D dark side. In Justice League 3, Batman and the remaining team would build a device, the cosmic treadmill, which would allow Flash to travel back to the past, warn Bruce about dark side and stress the importance of saving Lois's life, thereby changing the future. And we see that this nightmare future does come true. In visions throughout the Snyder Cut, we see Superman 
Bran cradling a burnt body, presumably Lois, inside of the Batcave, as evidenced by the Robin suit hidden in the back. The nightmare is real. We actually hear it from the Joker himself. You need me to help you undo this world you created by letting her die. How many alternate timelines do you destroy the world because you don't have the colonies to die yourself? The question, though, is in what universe is the Dark Nightmare future happening? Well, I firmly believe, based on the evidence in all these movies, that the Nightmare is the result of Joss Whedon's Justice League. Darkseid come to Earth, Superman turning evil, it's all the continuation of Justice League and what the canon DCEU is headed towards. When the Flash loops back and goes to warn the past, that sets up the Snyder stories, Batman v Superman and his version of Justice League. Those create a second timeline, the one that does things right and actually manages to save the Earth. But how can we be sure about this? Well, in the original cut of Justice League, Bruce Wayne has no idea about Lois Lane being the key to anything. He doesn't comment on his prophecies, he doesn't mention his dreams, he doesn't mention Lois Lane at all. Compare that to the Snyder cut, where he actively talks about his dreams with Diana. I had a dream. Barry Allen was right here, and he said to me, Lois Lane is the key. This is a reference to the Flash's warning in Batman v Superman. which is clearly happening on the second timeline, after these events have already transpired once. Because he wasn't warned, Batman in Justice League only thinks of Lois as the woman in a relationship with Superman. Nothing special to take note of. It would make sense that this version of Batman would drop the ball on protecting her. Or, as the Joker says, Why you sent a boy wonder? to do a man's job. But in the Snyder Cut, Bruce is keenly aware of Lois, outright commenting on her being pregnant with Superman's baby. Congratulations, by the way. And it's all because of the warning that he received from the future. In addition, the first version of Justice League shows us a much more fragmented team. Even as he goes out into the last battle, Batman just barks out the order. Don't wait for me, just do the job. When he gets saved by the rest of the League, Cyborg indicates that it wasn't a team decision. Hey, blame the lady. You, but she didn't ask for a vote. This indicates that the mainline DCEU Justice League isn't going to be as tightly knit as the Snyder Line Justice League, which is why we see them fighting and dying to Darkseid solo in the Nightmare Hallucinations. Further proof of this comes from the Joker references throughout the Nightmare. In the Snyder Cut's epilogue, we see Joker give Bruce a truce card. As long as you have this card, the truce. But all you have to do is tear it in half, and I'm happy to discuss with you in any way like why you sent a boy wonder to do a man's job. It's a symbol of them putting aside their differences to be a team. And in Batman v Superman, we actually see Bruce with that card taped to his gun. However, in the scene of Superman lording over the fallen remains of the heroes, we see the Joker's card torn. Batman broke the truce. A weak team ultimately leads to the destruction of humanity, mostly driven by Batman's ego. Meanwhile, the Snyder Cut shows us a team that cares much more about each other, with Barry specifically caring a lot about Bruce Wayne. Are you okay? Bruce? There's also smaller details here too, like how in the Nightmare Visions, Aquaman is killed by a three-pronged trident. That's the trident of Atlan, the one that we see him accept in the Aquaman movie, which is a canonical continuation of Joss Whedon's Justice League. And we know it based on a few details. First, the events of both films. In the Snyder Cut, Mira's parents are explicitly stated as being dead. My parents died in the wars. However, in the Aquaman movie, her father plays a significant role in the events that transpire. Additionally, we have ourselves Mira's accent. Here is how Mira talks in Aquaman. Your half-brother, King Orm, is about to declare war upon the surface world. Billions will die. Here's how she sounds in the original Justice League. It would have been her responsibility to follow that monster to the surface and stop it now. It's yours. And here's her completely different accent from the Snyder Cut. It would have been her responsibility to follow that monster to the surface and stop him. Now, it's yours. There's also the Flash. In Justice League, Barry has no confidence. In fact, he outright says that he's never done battle before. Full transparency, I've never done battle. I've just pushed some people and run away. His whole arc in that entire story is that he needs to save just one person. Save one. What? Save one person. 
compare that to the Snyder Cut, where Barry is not only saving people and hot dogs on the regular, but already knows how to use his extreme speed to manipulate time to such a degree that he can catch the exact moment a mother box hits the water. In Batman v Superman, we see a Barry who's trying to travel through time, but misses his target date. That would make sense if it was the first time that he was testing out time travel powers, pushing his limits only because of a severe need for survival, but the Snyder Cut's flash is honed in his time travel skills, which also makes sense if this is the second go-around for this universe. But the biggest detail that confirms all of this is the fact that in the Justice League, no one knows who Darkseid is. Unlike the Snyder Cut, which ends with the team facing him down and Martian Manhunter issuing a warning to Bruce, Justice League has nothing. The team has no frame of reference that Steppenwolf works for an evil even bigger bad. As such, they won't be preparing for this massive alien invasion, and without Batman's investment into Lois Lane's well-being, Darkseid will have little problem killing her, turning Superman evil. This darkest timeline will lead Barry Allen to hop on the cosmic treadmill and try to go back in time to alert Batman and create the alternate Snyder line where they actually have a chance to save the universe. In short, the nightmare epilogue created by Zack Snyder in his movie is dunking on the original cut, basically calling it the failed the ending of his storyline. This is what happens to the characters whose stories continue on. They die, they fail, the team falls apart. This, in turn, sets up the Snyder Cut to not only be canon, but also be the good conclusion of everything that came before, correcting the mistakes that were made in the past, which, come to think of it, is insanely meta considering that's how these movies themselves shaped up to be. The long and short of it is this. DC, listen to me. Sit down on the couch and actually listen to me, because sometimes you don't know what's good for you. You have yourselves a real shot here to please fans without totally backtracking on all your movies. You have yourself a win here served up on a silver platter. Don't blow it, because not even Flashpoint will be able to erase another misstep like that. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut.